So I have been betting and Betfair trading for a living for over 20 years now. And I really can't believe it. I mean, what a fantastic job. I basically get to watch sport for a living. When I first started doing this, people were deeply sceptical. And the funny thing is, is that there's still a lot of scepticism around what I do and why 20 years later. But in fact, that scepticism has actually led me into a path that allowed me to be infinitely more effective on the markets. And if you want to understand why, then watch the rest of this video. Please like and comment on this video. That will allow me to produce better quality videos and more of them. And if you're interested in learning from somebody that's been doing this for over 20 years, then subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon if you want notification of new videos as they're released. So let me take you back 20 years ago. Um, there was a bit of a history before I joined Betfair, but effectively I joined Betfair almost immediately. They became open for business in June 2000. There were a number of things that led me up to do that. And I already had an interest in financial markets, sports markets, gambling, statistics, all of those things um, before I turned up on this stage. But as soon as all the betting exchanges uh, came to light, I signed up for all of those accounts. One of them was Betfair. Um, because I knew that there was some sort of an opportunity there. Now, initially, I was arbing. I wasn't trading. I would go to a bookmaker, place a bet with them, and hedge that position on the exchange. You will be familiar with this because it's match betting that you see nowadays is how that uh, manifests itself. But yeah, I did that. That was the very first thing I ever did on Betfair. But I woke up one morning, two bets on the exchange, put two bets on the exchange, a lay bet and a back bet, um, and Betfair trading was born. To my surprise, and I don't know why it was a surprise, uh, but it was back then, both those positions got matched and I had a profit. And I suddenly thought, well, hold on a second here. This is a completely new thing that I'm looking at here. Um, why should I continue just arbing? There's probably lots of opportunities. And at that point, I became very interested in doing this a bit more seriously. Now, the problem that I had back then was I had a wife, three children, uh, a mortgage and a, and a really good career. Uh, my career was going fine. Um, I was earning lots of money. I was uh, zooming around Europe and the rest of the world um, and getting involved in some really interesting projects and meeting interesting people in interesting places and all of that stuff. The sort of job um, that uh, most people would aspire to. Um, but, you know, and, and I'll cut a long story short here. I always had this desire to go off and do something more interesting. Part of this was because I was in the IT industry, I'd seen many opportunities come and go, and this felt like another opportunity to me, so I went for it. Now, when you think about that, you know, how do you approach that with people? Uh, people are going to be skeptical. And, um, and indeed they were, uh, especially when I said, yep, I'm gonna go off and basically bet for a living. Because <laughs> I was trying to explain to people exactly what I did and or what I was planning to do. And even I didn't know if it would work because wind yourself right back to the very beginning. So I didn't go full time on Betfair straight away because there was nothing there. The volume and the liquidity was not there. So I had to wait for that to build a bit before I made that decision. But when I realized that there was a chance that I could do something, even then it wasn't substantial numbers. Um, it was still sort of relatively small and in its growth stage, but I knew that that would be the best time to catch the opportunity. Um, but, uh, you know, I'd always wanted to do my own thing. Um, this fitted almost perfectly by coincidence into, into the things that I was interested in, sports, statistics, trading. I was going to do it on financials. That was going to be my way out of the corporate world. And I did a 90 degree turn and ended up on Betfair. <laughs> and so when people said to me, oh, what are you going to do? And it's like, well, I was, you know, you can, you can, you can imagine the scepticism. I don't need to describe that anymore for you. And uh, very few people were very supportive of it. So one of the first lessons that I learned was, especially if you're breaking new ground, you're always going to have to, uh, people that are sceptical, people who don't understand, can't see the vision. So if you're creating a new product or service, um, you're doing something out of the ordinary, you know, most people, it, it doesn't float their boat um, and they are going to try and be critical. But I've, I've learned from early on in my life that that shouldn't be a barrier to you achieving something because... Very little was expected of me when I was young. I didn't have the right circumstances uh, to, to prosper, as it were, in any intellectually or financially. But nonetheless, I did actually uh, make it all work for me. So that was um, something that 
um, you know, had always been embedded in me. I didn't fear, um, you know, trying to better myself. That wasn't really a major issue for me. Um, but of course, you got lots of scepticism and I totally expected that at the start. I knew that people wouldn't understand where I was coming from. But you wind forward a few years later and, um, you know, I was determined to make a real go of this. So if you take yourself right back to the very start, there was no software. I didn't know if anybody else was trading. Betfair hadn't really acknowledged it. I didn't really talk about it because I wasn't sure if what I was doing would A, be considered acceptable with Betfair, or B, would last for very long because it seemed like such a golden opportunity to me. Um, you know, surely other people would step in and suddenly it would become a lot tougher. But a few years into the journey, um, I'd started to talk about it and it became, you know, people started to mention about betting exchanges more frequently and the concept of trading was starting to be talked about as well. And um, I helped with that process because I was going around, I was writing for Shares magazine in the early part of my career. I wrote for them for, I can't remember how many years, quite a few years. I wrote for a few magazines and I would go and visit these financial events where I would talk about stuff and Eventually, I started talking about betting exchanges. I threw off the shackles of the scepticism and started saying, well, hey, you know what? This is uh, like uh, you can trade the sports market the same way you trade a financial market. Uh, obviously, there are subtle differences there, but fundamentally, that was the message that was going out. And generally, I was getting um, a lot of encouragement and interest from the financial sector. But lots of other people were really sceptical which is a surprise because we're talking here at, at the stage at which I was introducing the concept. There was no software. I didn't make money any other way than trading. And that was basically, you know, I was talking conceptually about everything that was going on. And I remember I was stuck with a, re a refresher, um, on a website refresher, basically. It would just refresh the website every one second and then you could place it. That was the, the limit of the technology then. But I knew that there was so much more. I was working with stuff on financial markets that I really wanted to bring to um, sports markets. And during a talk that I did in London in 2004, I got contacted by somebody that was at that talk um, who could see the same vision. Um, and we started working together and Bet Angel was born. So it's important to understand that Bet Angel was a product of that early work. It was one of the first bits of Betfair trading software, certainly the first serious bit. There were some rudimentary bits of software around in those early days. Um, and I could see that we needed something like that to take us to the next level. So as soon as Bet Angel was born, um, my trading just completely took off because suddenly I had all the tools that I needed to be able to take my trading to the next level. But of course, as soon as you put a product in front of you, there's a little bit of scepticism there, which you can sort of understand, especially in an industry like the betting industry and the trading industry. Could you have two more worse industries um, for people that, that say a lot but don't actually do much? Uh, but in essence, the software was the thing that accelerated my trading and took me up another level. Um, and of course, you're always going to talk positively about that. And my vision back then was that exchanges would be dominant global forces and each individual horse race would trade 20 million in five years time and stuff like that. But of course, that never really happened. It never, you know, for a whole number of reasons that I'm not going to go into into this video, the market never particularly reached that size. Um, but nonetheless, the trading was going fine. And when you look at my progression, I started on doing football and financials because that was where I had my specialist knowledge. I, I priced football markets 15 years earlier um, and I'd been working on financial markets for slightly shorter than that period of time, but I had models and stuff that I could transplant straight into the exchange. But I wanted to expand into other markets. So I then started that long journey of basically um, going into other markets. And one of the markets I wanted to target was horse racing because horse racing had enormous numbers of markets. There was huge volume and I thought I've got to find a way to be able to actively trade on horse racing. Uh, so what I did was I came up with the process and method of trading horse racing by looking at order flow and price action basically. And this was something that I'd seen done in financial markets. I thought I could do it on horse racing markets and lo and behold, it worked. But what this was, was a culmination of a lot of work. So 
if you look at how I trade golf, for example, I trade many different sports now. I'm more active than I've ever been in my entire uh, Betfair trading career. I do more work. I have very large amounts of turnover. I trade more sports. Um, I trade manually, automatically. Um, my activity is way above where I started. Um, but it's been a, a gradual progression. I start with a simple strategy. I try and look at a different sport. I come up with some basic strategies, build, refine, hone them, look at the data, improve them, and take them forward from there. So what you see now is the culmination of all of that experience. Um, and it, But it's been a very slow progression through each of those stages. But of course, I've had 20 years in which to do that. But, you know, one of the things that used to frustrate me was... I've always worked really hard in any job that I've had. And it was the same with Betfair Trading. I would devote an awful lot of time, energy and effort. And uh, you ask my wife, <laughs> you know, one of the first things that I did was I, I, I basically started working on a Saturday. I figured out that Saturdays were the most important day of the week. So very early on in my career, I said to my wife, sorry, but actually Saturdays are the days when I'm going to earn most of my money. So that's it, you know, Saturdays I'm going to be working, but I will take another day off during the week or whatever. Um, and at first, obviously, that, that was a, a little bit frustrating. But after a while, she began to realise and understand, that, you know, that that was an important part of exactly what I do. And that's the way that the market works. You, know, you can't be a footballer playing at the highest level and then sort of say, oh, I'm not going to play in the Champions League because it's on a Saturday now. <laughs> you wouldn't do that. And it's the same. You know, if you want to achieve good things, you have to sacrifice and work hard towards them. But despite all of, of this and, you know, I've worked really hard to do a number of things. I've quantified what I'm doing. I've documented it very heavily. And um, I wanted to at some point when I finish doing this and I have no idea when that will be at the moment, I sort of thought, wouldn't it be fun just to go back through everything that I've done. Um, but also there's, the, there's the, the, the process of, you know, probably at some point I may hand it on. I, th I thought maybe I'd last, you know, maybe three to five years or something. So to last 20 is amazing. And I sort of think that maybe I will go on for a bit longer from here as well. But ultimately I'd, I'd done all of that work, carefully worked, you know, to quantify stuff, figure out what I was doing, why it was happening and, and things like this. But still the skepticism came. And you sort of, you know, all that seems to change over time is you get a different type of sceptic. But I remember somebody, you know, really lambasting, really going for it and um, saying what a, a complete fraud I was. And so I dropped him a note and just sort of said, well, I've got nothing to hide. So why don't you come and see me? Would he do that? No, he would not. It's like, I don't need to see you. Oh, I've seen people like you before. Blah, blah. And I was sort of saying to him, no, no, hold on a second, you know this is this is all real this is all of the stuff that i've done this is the background to it, the history and why the software was created and what i'm now doing and and he was sort of thinking oh well it's easy for you to say and it's like well that's because it's true <laughs> i'm actually doing it and and it's funny because you know this used to annoy and rile me and basically drive me completely up the wall because you'd be working enormous hours you'd be getting up at three o'clock in the morning to do something or you'd you know completely um like Cheltenham last year, I, I traded all 28 races, profited from all 28. And, you know, that's not the first time I've done it. It won't be the last time that I do it. And I've also done it on BetDAC and Betfair. And, you know, it's unequivocal. You can see there the evidence that, that I'm active. But still, people seem to struggle to come to terms with it. Not everybody, but some people do. And it just used to, like, really annoy me. And then about 10 years ago, I suddenly figured out um, that there was a structure behind this. Because I would talk to people and, you know, I figured out that what was happening was they had a, a view on something and then they would start searching for evidence to support that view. And what I was actually looking at there was a behavioural bias called confirmation bias. People would make their mind up about something and then try and find evidence to support that theory. And I was thinking, well, that's weird because I'm sort of telling people exactly what the deal is and you're not getting it. And, you know, and every time I try and query that, then it just seems to reinforce that view. So I suddenly started going off down this tangent in terms of looking at the market, not from a perspective of quantifying it, trying to understand what was going on in the market and if there was a price differential and if that differential would correct. I suddenly started to look at the market from a psychological perspective. I started to do everything backwards. I started to think, well, there's this bias. How would this bias manifest itself in the market? 
Um, how would that play out and where am I likely to find that? And then can I quantify that to see that it exists? So I sort of did almost an about face. I suddenly started looking at the market in a, from a different perspective and quantifying it from um, the behavioural aspect and also backing that up with the statistics where I'd, I'd only had one side of that equation in place for many years. And it completely transformed the way that I trade. It presented new opportunities to me, taught me a lot about the way that the market works and where I'm likely to find those opportunities. So in a, in a weird sort of twist of fate, um, all of the people that were sceptical, and, and some still are, um, actually presented me with one of the greatest opportunities that I could have. Um, because watching and seeing what people did and said um, allowed me to understand where those biases were likely to appear. And then I would understand and quantify it and then go to exploit that within the market. And the funny thing is, I've always felt this obligation that I should talk to people about what I do. So I do do that. And this is when I produce videos and articles. I, I just talk to you about something that I find interesting that I think that you'll find interesting. Um, and I don't sort of sugarcoat it or, you know, I try and get balance in there wherever I can. But it seems that some people just read or watch what they want to hear. And, um, and you can't really change that. So I've sort of given up with the hope of being able to change people's minds. And the phrase that I use very often is negative people find problems, positive people find opportunities. So if you're going to be negative, be negative, but don't expect any support from me or necessary to engage me in, in any way, because I'm done with that. You know, I've worked really hard for a long period of time. And, but if you engage positively with me, I, I will give you positive feedback and try and point you in the right direction. But be aware when I produce videos, articles and give you advice in general, the problem that I have is I somehow have to crunch down 20 years worth of experience into a paragraph, a 10 minute video, an article or a one liner. So it's impossible for me to retain the granularity. If you want to find an issue with something that I do, you can find it everywhere because I can't give you that level of granularity without having to spend all day with you explaining the nuances of every single thing that I'm talking about. I have to summarize it, shorten it, make it more compact. Even this video is, go is taking too long. Um, so, so when you see something that I present, you know, it's, it's a slightly sanitized version, but just purely for brevity. Um, but nonetheless, you know, if you want to be cynical, you can be cynical, but you will not gain a thing from it. I've worked in these markets for so long. I'm betting and trading millions a week through these markets. I'm trying to find opportunities all the time. I love what I do and I can see that I could probably continue for a long period of time. I never thought that would be possible because I thought that I would get pushed out of the market, but I figured out that one thing that never changes is human nature. And if you research that and look at that, you will suddenly start to see the world through a different set of eyes and you'll begin to find opportunities that perhaps you couldn't do, maybe through just data alone. If you want to pick up on this and make an effort to learn more about this, um, the thing that you're searching for really are behavioural biases. And if you want to research each individual one and begin to understand it a bit better, there's an excellent resource available online called the Behavioural, I can even say it, the Behavioural um, Bias Codex. I should bring up an image and, and show you what it looks like. But if you find that and look at that particular article and that subject, it actually beautifully links to categorizations and subdivisions of each of those biases. There are a lot of them, some are more important than others, but it will really give you a good indication as to the way that people behave. And it taught me uh, the mistake that a lot of cynics were making. And I understand that people are gonna be skeptical because especially in an industry like this, um, and you know, in aligned industries such as financial trading markets, it's very difficult for new people to figure out who is genuine or not. Um, but nonetheless, you know, you just need to be objective and figure out and work it out for yourself. Um, and you should be able to find a path through that minefield. Uh, but ultimately, a lot of the uh, cynicism that I get is be because of behavioural biases. I know that they, they, people who are sceptical will say, oh, now you're, you're just trying to find a reason to uh, put doubt on us. But no, it's actually your, your problem because I am here. I am doing it. I have done it for a long period of time. And probably on a scale that would, people would just find unimaginable because I learned to trade very early on um, and everything since then has been refining it and improving it and becoming better at what I do. And like any skill, 
if you do it for long enough, you will just get much better. I've faced cynicism, skepticism, all the way through my entire career, despite trying to do everything for the right reasons and despite working really, really hard. And whatever you're doing within life, whether it is trading or something else that you're setting out on, maybe a, a project or some idea that you've got, expect people to be critical. But ultimately, you should never let people stop you doing whatever your desire is, because you're probably the only person that truly understands. Um, and if people put barriers in your way, then really those are there for you to climb over and you may actually better learn something from it. So anyhow, slightly rambly video, but I hope that some of that content has been useful for you.